Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Make sure not to miss a single podcast and subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. For more than 50 years, the U.S. Army War College's Eisenhower Series College Program, or ESCP, has been designed to encourage dialogue on national security and other policy issues between War College students and the broader public. In pursuit of dialogue, War College students in the program travel across the country, speaking to college classes, voluntary organizations, think tanks, and in other public forums. Here at A Better Peace, we hope to give our listeners a sense of what the ESCP students present and how this system works by giving Eisenhower participants a chance to share their expertise and insights by offering short versions of their Eisenhower speeches and discussing both the implications of those speeches and their personal experiences with the program and at the War College in general. Today's podcast is one in a planned series for the class of 2023. Today's topic is domestic security, where once the United States could consider itself secure behind two oceans with friendly neighbors to the north and south, the age of globalization has made borders more permeable and has also raised new challenges for the preservation of domestic tranquility. Our two guests today have both considered new aspects of domestic security and the possible role of the military in securing it. Lieutenant Colonel Nate Minot is an Army Air Defense officer with 20 years of military service and numerous deployments. He recently led 150 soldiers and officers to educate, train, and develop new soldiers on Army Air Defense weapons, such as Patriot and Stinger. He has extensive experience developing advanced military capabilities through the Army acquisition process. Lieutenant Colonel Minot received his undergraduate degree from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, go Vols, and holds a master's degree from the Army General Staff and Command College. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Powers is a military police officer with over 23 years of service in the Missouri National Guard. He has deployed for Operation Noble Eagle in support of Homeland Security following the 9-11 attacks, Operation Iraqi Freedom. He has trained units in Panama and Poland and has responded to numerous state emergencies ranging from natural disasters to civil unrest. When not in uniform, Chris serves as the managing member of a law firm that specializes in real estate litigation. And because he doesn't have enough to do, he also operates a beef cattle farm. Chris received his JD from the University of Missouri, Kansas City in 2007 and is licensed to practice law in multiple state and federal jurisdictions throughout the Midwest. Welcome to A Better Peace, Nate Minot and Chris Powers. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Happy so, to be here. So, gents, to get us started, I want to give you each a chance to offer a, a summary version of your Eisenhower uh, program speeches. And uh, we drew we drew lots backstage beforehand, like they do on Wheel of Fortune. And we went with Nate to go first. Nate. Absolutely. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to come onto a podcast. Uh, longtime listener, uh, first time guest. So. Um, so absolutely. Uh, so my my topic uh, looked at uh, drone security from a domestic perspective. Uh, an event happened really within my first uh, two months here at Carlisle. Uh, my son goes to the local high school. He ran cross country with them. And uh, at one of the events, a, uh, a drone, a simple quadcopter showed up. Uh, hovered above the start line. Uh, the announcers told them to leave. Uh, and then the race proceeded to just happen. Uh, and the drone just followed them. And, and that incident uh, or non-incident for a lot of folks uh, really caused a lot of concern for me because as, as someone who's been in air defense for a long time, has done a lot of counter UAS things, I was I was aghast at just the lackadaisical attitudes of, of everyone that day, uh, and then I really wanted to understand like what what capabilities uh, were available even to a small school or municipality, uh, 
Um, so I tried to apply uh, my military uh, knowledge, um, trying to eliminate the jargon that we tend to have in the military uh, to then be able to engage in a conversation as we went out on all of these, uh, uh, these tours uh, with different organizations. Uh, and it boiled down to basically two things um, is, is really trying to identify intent uh, and then developing fail saves. And what I found is just with domestically, both of those two things are, are very problematic. You know, so, so if we're looking at trying to identify intent, one of the things we do in the military is we develop boundaries. Um, and then developing boundaries domestically experiences a ton of problems and it actually hinders a lot of efficiencies uh, that companies have and it unintentionally increased costs on homeowners. Uh, there's several cases that, that I found that, uh, that did exactly that when uh, local municipalities put boundaries over homesteads, for instance. Hmm. And so, so there's, there's some conversation there about how to effectively in place boundaries for drones. The, the, the second piece to intent is communication. Um, and for communication, uh, the FAA recently passed legislation that requires um, or sorry, regulation. The FAA recently passed regulation, which requires transponders in all drones. The challenge there is in order to communicate, that means I'm, I'm riding on the back of a cell phone tower. I'm riding on, on 5G network, uh, which introduces uh, all kinds of privacy concerns for citizens and uh, uh, operators. And then the last thing that, that astounded me was when it comes down to fail safes and being able to actually uh, implement uh, safety measures uh, in the event you, you can't determine intent and you can't determine what that drone is doing, um, there is only a very small subset of federal agencies that have the authority uh, to either disrupt, to seize, um, to, or, or even use reasonable force. Uh, to damage or disable those drones. And so those, those authorities, uh, they only exist with certain federal agencies. Local municipalities, uh, if they were to do those things, open themselves up to numerous litigation claims of personal property damage uh, or even privacy violations. And so that, that is really what my speech was about. And it was interesting to have this conversation with college students uh, and, and the public to at least open their, their minds or their, their thoughts to the potential dangers and how difficult it is to actually apply regulation policy domestically um, mm -hmm. and, and, and to do that and at the same time try to find a way to, uh, to advance technology so it betters life. Gosh, well, Nate, Nate, we're going to come back to questions, but I got to ask: Did you ever find out who was who was operating? Was that drone at the race? Was it one of the one of the racers? that they were using it for their hype video for college uh, scouts? So that's exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. uh, it was one of the elite racers that day that wanted to use it as a hype video, and it just followed him around. It uses mm -hmm. tracking technology, which is another crazy thing to to follow him around the track uh, or the course. Sorry, mm -hmm. to follow him around the course. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it, it was, it was harrowing for me, mm -hmm. everyone else, include my son, they didn't even realize there was something up there. Right. And of course you were thinking, where's my nearest Patriot battery? I can take care of that drone. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We'll come, we'll come back to you, Nate. Thank you very much. Now, Chris Powers, let's hear, let's hear your speech. Sure. So thanks again, Ron. It's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and just be speaking on the podcast. Um, so I was the, the sole National Guard member on our Eisenhower panel. And so I, I felt incumbent that uh, really I thought the focus should be from my perspective on domestic operations. So it, it fits right within this particular podcast. So I, I focus on a couple of different areas. Um, and Nate, Nate hit on a fantastic one him, uh, himself that I hadn't really given much consideration to. But uh, the two that I focused on, the first was uh, a, a situation about really, I guess, a, a case for restricting foreign direct investment in United States real estate. It's funny, I uh, mentioned that uh, part in my biography about uh, raising Angus livestock back in Missouri because a component of this particular talk has to do with agriculture and food security. I found it to be a, a little bit distracting because the college students that we encountered are, are watching this Yellowstone series. And so I get cornered after every talk about all these 
questions about the Duttons, you know, ranging from calf bearing operations in the winter to, you know, the ethics of retribution against competing ranch owners. So I found it to be a little bit distracting, but it, it, was, a, it was really a great, great time discussing this topic with, with students from throughout the country. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the, the genesis of this particular topic. Back in 2021, uh, I had rep I represent an investment firm who acquires uh, properties with 30 title, I'll call it. Uh, it's properties that are being sold uh, for delinquent taxes or uh, some other encumbrance that uh, is being foreclosed upon. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 2021, I was really surprised after having uh, visited this particular auction site for a period of about five years to find a significant number of uh, foreign investors. And so it got me thinking uh, as I was selected for War College, is there a national security component uh, to what's going on out in the United States real estate market? And, and I concluded now, having done this for a while, that, that there is a concern. Uh, in fact, there, there are three different categories of concern as I've kind of come to research the issue. Uh, and really, the, these revolve around not just, you know, the individual investor going out and acquiring a residential lot, but we're talking about foreign investment firms with direct ties to uh, competitive, if not outright adversarial governments from throughout the, uh, the world. Uh, investing right here in, in America's homeland. And so really it generated three different courses of concern to me uh, that I speak uh, with students about. The first has to do with uh, the acquisition, as I mentioned in the introduction, of large tracts of agricultural land. Uh, and that in of, of itself is concerning, but uh, if you look at it within the context of this combination of other vulnerabilities within our ag sector right now, uh, long term could chronically result not only in food security concerns within our country, but uh, the application of our country's soft power in utilizing food as a as a mechanism uh, to bring stability and peace through other parts of the world. So there's some vulnerability there. Um, the second category relates to the acquisition of land that either consists of or is within close proximity to key infrastructure. And this is more of your just your garden variety operational security concern. Uh, we're seeing with the Chinese Communist Party, the acquisition of key infrastructure really throughout Central and South America seems to continue to creep closer to our borders. And I've got some good example, uh, good examples of where that's occurring. And then, then the th third category deals with matters of post acquisition investment behavior. And uh, as I've come to study this, really, there are two different concerns. The first has to do with foreign autocratic governments who have uh, what they call capital control laws. And in essence, what that is, is the ability for the government itself in these foreign governments to come in and, and seize and unilaterally foreclose upon and, and either take title to or sell uh, the, the acquisition or the, the, the ownership interests of their individual citizens or their business corporations. And so you can kind of see what some national national security concerns would, would be there. Uh, the second category within that third kind of large framework of, of concerns has to do with behavior itself. So we're talking about uh, the depletion of natural resources in some of our most fertile, fertile uh, agricultural areas. Uh, the, the key example there is the uh, Saudi Arabian acquisition of about 30,000 acres just outside of Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where there's already a really concerning drought issue uh, there in the Colorado River Basin. And that firm going in and essentially acquiring uh, thousands of, uh, of gallons, millions of gallons of water uh, and depleting the freshwater aquifer there. So, so there's some natural concerns there as well. That's a real quick summary of the first topic. Uh, the second topic that I, that I talk about and that, that uh, has been very interesting to kind of go through and, and talk with college students about is restoring a component of the restoration of the United States military's trust and confidence, as well as civilian law enforcement institutions. And so within this discussion, I talk about really the transition that I saw in the public response to National Guard's men and women arriving uh, to quell civil unrest between uh, Ferguson in 2014 with the killing of Michael Brown, and then fast forward just a small period of six years in the police killing of George Floyd. And the really extreme difference that I witnessed on ground in both of those events um, from protest groups since civilians alike. And, and so I study within the context of that issue, uh, how we got there and, uh, and what the Department of Defense's role uh, in this concern about militarization of civilian law enforcement. And I've got some ideas and some data behind um, how we got to where we're at and as well as, you know, how we can pivot 
and move uh, progressively uh, in a more peaceful way moving forward. And so with that brief introduction, uh, Ron, I'll turn it back to you for any any questions or follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And, you know, listening to both of your your speeches, the, the what I see is linking them together. And what I'd like to really get at with both of you is this issue of, not to put too fine a point on it, this issue of authority, right? Who has the authority to deal with any of these questions, right? Because if I say, you know, there's something fishy about a foreigner uh, buying land, then the question is, well, Who's going to stop them? Or if I say there's something, there's something really dangerous about somebody deciding to fly a drone over a big crowd of people, and that person might think, well, I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just trying to help my kid's chance of getting a scholarship. But who are they supposed to go to to get permission to do that? And if they don't, who has the authority to stop them? Right? You know, is somebody going to run out there with a slingshot and knock it down? Um, and and if they do, right? How are they, you know who's the basically who's in the wrong here? And, and this gets back to the with, the with the question of the National Guard as well, is if the Guard is brought in to keep the peace, right, there's always the danger that the protesters who, who may feel as though they themselves are within their rights to protest feel as though the National Guard has come to shut them up. And, you know, so, so the Guard may present itself and want to imagine itself as acting as a neutral arbiter of peace. But, you know, how does the guard behave in such a way so they can be, they can live up to their responsibility. So for both of you, uh, th this, this issue of authority, right? Who has it? Um, if we're trying to figure out who has it, um, what are the avenues by which we can decide uh, as a society to, to give the authority and to exercise that authority? Um, you know, Nate, we can't, we can't give every high school a, uh, a stinger battery to take care of, of, uh, unauthorized drones. Although that would be one solution. Anyway, no, I, I shouldn't say that. We might've cut that part out, but, <laughs> but, uh, or leave it in, but, um, but Nate, so I'm going to start with you. So this question of authority, right. In, in the work that you've done so far, right. How do we deal with this question of who's supposed to enforce anti-drone laws? Like there's an anti-drone sign outside of Carlisle barracks when you drive up that tells you. You know, don't fly drones here. But that's the United States Army controls this place. And I guess they know what they would do if they saw one. But, but how do we figure out the authority for protecting us against these kinds of things? So, so absolutely, Ron, you know, uh, so in my in my work with uh, Department of Defense, even four years ago, that this, this, that discussion of who has what authority ran rampant. Because we had to first identify what were the most critical aspects, right? What were the things that were most vulnerable, uh, the, the, the things that would harm national security? Uh, and so, so on that end, uh, homeland security, uh, federal aviation uh, uh, decided they would take uh, the bulk of the effort to try to at least lay the framework uh, mm -hmm. for what authorities should be had. Um, and so that's how we end up currently with a situation where only that small subset of federal agencies have that authority to do something, whether it be physical uh, destruction of the aircraft or disruption, seizure, uh, taking control of it. Um, but now that 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 to me has a very clear path forward, mm. what we're discussing or what I discuss is what is the plan for these smaller municipalities? Because you're right, you're not you aren't going to have a stinger battery over every facility. Um, even even organizations like the NFL mm -hmm. uh, have massive amount of people coming in the organization and the facility. They don't have the authority to do anything. Uh, and currently, unless uh, the uh, the city police are deputized by the federal agency to engage, they don't. And, and so you've seen this past year numerous reports of uh, NFL games, NCAA games just being halted. Mm. Just we just stop the game, get the players off the field, and wait. Um, and that's that's dangerous. That's that's mm. that's very very dangerous. Um, and so the the conversation. Uh, I, I believe really needs to happen with the local municipality and the state federal agency to figure out what the states want to do. Uh, 
um, and then request that from the FAA and Homeland Security to have to, to downgrade that authority, to give that, that ability for them to, to enact. But in order to do that, they have to have these boundaries set up, right? Like that's, that's what's going to enable them. If they understand what the boundaries are, if they understand how they're going to communicate to create, you know, that back and forth to determine the intent that gives what I believe the federal uh, organizations the ability to then grant that authority down to the states and mm-hmm. down to the local municipalities. Right. Well, and and Chris, I, I see the, the the parallel here as well. I, I the the land, uh, the audience should know that I was fortunate enough to be on a panel with Chris and a couple of the other Eisenhower students live and in person. So, we've he's already heard me go on and on about this subject. I'll try not to to be too repetitive, but this idea of how in a, in a free society where we let people who own property sell property to anybody, as long as they're above board, follow the rules and doing it, who's going to have the responsibility to say, well, we're just not sure that this buyer should own this piece of land. Um, because you know, how do we, it goes back to, it's like the intent question with, uh, with Nate's drones, right? Is if a Saudi investor wants to buy a bunch of land, um, how is how is that investor different from any other investor? Or do we have to wait until it turns out that they're draining resources or doing something else before we know what they're doing? And how do how how can we push back against the threat? If there's you know how, how can we identify the threat and push back against it? Thanks, Ron. That's that's a great question, and it's one that both uh, state legislatures and the federal legislature are are really kind of scrutinizing right now. You know, the, the, the concerns are, are several and it's a very it's a complex issue um, on one side. You know, to your point, uh, look, we live in a free market system and uh, this, frankly, regulating this type of behavior is one of those that diminishes free market principles. Mm-hmm. Um, at the same time, uh, we've done this before uh, and, it, and it didn't work out so well. Uh, the two historic examples, the first one being uh, the alien land laws, as they were called in California, uh, leading up to World War II, where we were interning the Japanese and, and divesting them of their land interests. That was not a pretty time in history, and it left a, a black mark on on, uh, on society. The other was the quote-unquote Arab takeover of the 1970s, um, similar sort of thing when the, when the Saudis were uh, attempting to acquire a, a sizable portion of, of United States land. Uh, so so the, the difficulties are these. On the state side, the state will say, you know, anything not uh, regulated by the federal government for the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution is regulated by the states. Uh, the states will also argue that this is within their uh, police power, the power to protect the health of, of its citizens. And when we talk about the concern over uh, bioterrorism in the context of agriculture, this is where the state will come in and attempt to leverage that authority. But on the other side, you know, we have to deal with foreign countries uh, uniformly uh, under the Foreign, uh, foreign Affairs Act and, uh, in, and under the International Commerce Clause. And so there's, there's room for federal regulation. What I've suggested, uh, regardless of, of these constitutional concerns and waiting for those issues to bubble up through the appeals court to the uh, United States Supreme Court, is to let's, let's look at what regulations we already have and, can, and determine as Nate would describe, intent of the investor through a different, a couple of different mechanisms. The first is uh, we have a, a committee on foreign investment in the United States. It's called CFIUS, is the is the acronym for it. And uh, in my mind, we need to broaden CFIUS's uh, perception of what a, a foreign investment into the United States uh, means and, and what the intent behind it is. And so, in the past, we have blocked, for example. Uh, attempts by foreign governments to acquire chip manufacturing companies, uh, specifically one, I think it was in Seattle, uh, that was uh, one of the component parts of those chips were being used in our Patriot missile system. So there's a, a natural national security concern with divesting uh, that, that investment over to a foreign entity. I'm suggesting that we could utilize that same authority uh, to regulate land ownership if it comes to the point where we're so concerned by the divestiture of the United States agricultural land that it presents a food security issue. So that's that's one area. Um, a second area is, is revising our Foreign Ownership Disclosure Act uh, to, to make it punitive. And so right now, if you're a foreign investor, whether you're an individual or an entity uh, that's been incorporated in a, in a foreign country, 
uh, you are required to report to the United States Department of Agriculture your acquisition of land so that the USDA at a minimum can track um, who owns what throughout the country. Uh, right now, uh, there's no teeth behind that. And one of the, uh, the, the visual aids that I oftentimes bring around with me to these uh, talks with students is a letter I got from the United States Department of Agriculture where they were attempting me, uh, attempting to force me uh, to fill out that Foreign uh, Ownership Disclosure Act paperwork. And I refused to knowing uh, candidly that there wasn't a, there's no teeth to that regulation. And, and so, so that to me is another area where at a minimum we can get uh, with, with the requirement of, of, uh, of disclosure, we can at least have a good understanding of where those assets are being held by foreign entities. And then should we need to take some emergency action in the future, either through federal legislation or state by state, we, we have the basis to do that because we actually have data, uh, good solid data behind that. Um, so that's the second area. And then as it applies to the Department of Defense specifically, I think that we have to work with uh, our state and federal legislators a little bit more frequently as it applies to ens ensuring that we have buffer zones around some of our, our most precious operational security uh, apparatuses. And so just, just a couple of examples that I talk about often uh, with our international affairs students is uh, the acquisition of, of land that surrounds Grand Forks uh, up in uh, North Dakota, where we house our RQ-4 uh, surveillance drone and some of our most uh, important critical technology that communicates between our satellite and UAV systems. Uh, right, off, right outside of the base, there's a Chinese firm that's acquired land there, and, and several local citizens are concerned about what their behavior is uh, since that acquisition has occurred. Similar thing has, acquired, has happened down at Laughlin Air Base. I think it was 150,000 acres were acquired by a foreign firm, essentially surrounding uh, the installation. And as we know, many of these installations were constructed back, uh, you know, well before the technology that we have today was in existence. Most of these uh, systems and most of these infrastructure components were built, you know, in the run up to World War II. And we weren't thinking at that time about satellite equipment or UAV technology. And, and now we are, and we have to ensure that there's adequate buffer zones around those facilities to do so. So to me, those were, are some examples of where the authorities can be uh, utilize existing authorities and then potentially the use of additional authorities uh, if our legislators uh, can act cooperatively uh, in, in light of this particular issue. And, and of course that, I'd, you know, you know, you save the the hook for the end there, right? I mean, the issue comes down to cooperation, and I'm thinking for both of you, right? Is that there? There's the the twofold problem here, right? One is to see identify what what's an actual threat versus what's only an apparent threat or what's no threat at all, and then once you've identified the threat, to actually develop the capabilities and apply the capabilities to neutralize that threat. Um, so, you know, somebody buying land in North Dakota might be a threat, might not be a threat. Um, how, you know, at what point do you realize if it is right? You um, and then if it, if it becomes that, are there laws in place that allow for the, as you say, the disinvestment of of property, or are there laws in place like as as far as using a drone? You know, if someone uses a drone I improperly, I guess if you were able to follow it back to its headquarters, you would or wherever it was launched from, or find the person who's standing off behind a behind a shed somewhere holding the remote control, right? Then maybe there's somebody to punish. But otherwise, you just don't you don't know who it's from and what you're supposed to do. And so, there's so many different things to talk about here, and we don't have a lot of time. But I want to get to both of you uh, uh, to get your thought about this. Is how do you imagine, especially the role of the United States? military and the Department of Defense, right? Because we're, we're very sensitive in this country with good reason to the use of military, uh, the, the use of the use of military instruments of power within the boundaries of the U.S. Um, how can we use military uh, capability and expertise to either help train local officials to take care of these problems or to be prepared to step in in the event that it's necessary? without raising all kinds of difficult constitutional and political questions about the role of the military within the boundaries of the United States. Ron, I, 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 don't, I don't think I've ever been posed that particular question when it comes to drone capabilities, partially because the, the best defeat mechanisms out there are 
commercial hmm. off the shelf type capabilities. Okay. Uh, they're they're not the the Stinger missile <laughs> or or the Patriot. Um, but what I have noticed is there are many former military personnel, people who have worked within the the space of of air defense or air control uh, within the Air Force or, or actually remote piloted vehicle operators who are now in uh, the commercial space for drone capabilities. Uh, and, and it's those individuals who are influencing and, and having those conversations and, uh, and helping to educate the public um, the ones that are, again, are most interested are, are the companies that are buying and building drones, the mm-hmm. companies that are interested in uh, developing uh, this add-on capability and what can drones do for them. Where I don't see any of that knowledge is being applied to the policy side. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it seems to be uh, only what is going to... Uh, either completely eradicate the use of drones over my facility or how can I make drones more ubiquitous across the board? And I, and I would say what I would like to see is I would like to see more engagement from individuals who have this knowledge of how to determine intent engaged with policymakers, which was a fascinating portion of my conversation when we got to speak with public policy students sure. um, for them to think through where can I gain this knowledge from? Who can I pull this information from? See, that's good. Cause of course the military has devoted a great deal of thought to the question of what to do about drones. So there is the right. possibility of there's the possibility for dialogue and education to help to make, to develop policies. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think that's, uh, that's the part where I, in my research, I haven't seen a lot of fruit uh, mm-hmm. is using military knowledge to help develop policies and procedures, not necessarily just applying military capabilities and using systems to defeat you know, drones. Right. The smart aleck in me would say is because there's more money in teaching people how to fly drones than there is to teach people how to limit the flying of drones. But we, we I, that, I, I, you, 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 you need neither confirm nor deny that. That's all right. That is most likely true. <laughs> Thank you, Nate. And Chris, how about you? I mean, you know, since I know that in your, uh, in, in, in all your spare time, right, you also happen to be a lawyer. So making rules is kind of making rules and helping people figure out how to follow them is what you do. Um, you know, how do we you know, how does the military stay a part of this conversation or become a part of this conversation without raising hackles or concerns? I have a couple of thoughts. You know, when you raise that question to Nate, the, the first thing that came to my mind were the number of incident command um, systems training events that I've been involved with as, as a guardsman. Mm-hmm. These are events where we Essentially, we, we embed ourselves uh, within the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, and we come together with, could be county commissioners, it could be uh, local law enforcement, a number of different uh, local, state, and federal entities uh, through these training courses, and we try to s- start speaking a common language through the National Incident Management System so that we're all kind of in the same conversation and we're able to utilize a common language to uh talk about how we're going to react, not just to natural disasters, but to domestic threats like the one Nate's raised. And so to me, it's going to be an awareness issue given the relative newness of this particular issue. But uh, but to your broader point, one of the things that, that we have to be very, very cautious of is ensuring that there's a separation, a clear separation between uh, military operations, National Guard operations, and, and civilian uh, law enforcement operations. The uh, this this really kind of goes to that second speaking topic that I mentioned. I uh, I remember after uh, the the George Floyd incident, I was uh, approaching a group of soldiers who were on the opposite side um, of a street intersection that they were supposed to be patrolling. And in in times of uh, you know when the National Guard rolls in, we're giving very very specific orders about what our perimeter is and and how far we can stretch beyond that and what our rules on use of force are and such. And so I remember approaching these soldiers 
and you know yelling at them as I, or at least uh, uh, vocally uh, directing them as I approach them to get back on the appropriate side of the intersection. And they looked at me like I was crazy. And so I continued a little bit quicker with my sergeant major and directed them, hey, get get on this side of the street. You, you know, you know what our limit of advance essentially is here. And as I looked down to identify the soldiers by their name tape, it said Jackson County Sheriff's Office. Oh. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the, the he was dressed exactly, you know, in full battle uniform, exactly like my soldiers had an M4 identical to the ones that our soldiers train and, and, and utilize had a Kevlar helmet that could, was not distinguishable from those of my soldiers. So, um, so, so having said that, uh, I, again, the separation is important to me because as we've seen civilian law enforcement uh, reputations erode, we've seen also the military's reputation erode. And I can't help but think that a part of that is the inability for the public to distinguish between the two. Um, and, and so as, as you talked about the issue about laws and authorities uh, earlier, uh, the one thing that kind of shocked me as I went through this uh, kind of the, I guess, the investigatory or research process, pro process here was that, uh, you know, and how we got to the quote unquote militarized uh, civilian law enforcement. I looked at some some statistics, you know, the, the Department of uh, Defense back in the 1990s as part of the war on, on drugs. Uh, came up with this authority under the National Defense Authorization Act to give uh, su local civilian uh, law enforcement the ability to utilize military, uh, even combat lethal equipment in the counter drug operation. And because of that limited scope, not very many civilian law enforcement agencies approved of it and, and utilized it. Fast forward until the run up really of George Floyd, that, that authority was expanded uh, for any general law enforcement purpose. And so the consequence of that almost immediately was, I think, $8 billion worth of co lethal combat equipment going into civilian law enforcement agency hands, mo many of whom weren't at all trained on the equipment, weren't trained on how to utilize it uh, or operate it or maintain it. Uh, and looking through the statistics on it, I remember seeing 79,000 assault rep weapons that went out uh, to civilian law enforcement, 750 armored personnel carriers. Uh, there was over 200 grenade launchers, 420 aircraft, and of all things, 11,000 bayonets. Uh, and so uh, again, th this is an authority that the, the Department of Defense has. And to me, as Nate was talking about with kind of local uh, decision-making and local authorities, I think this is an area where we have to engage uh, locals on, on this particular issue. I, I, you know, the, the three things that I kind of recommended was number one, until we get a handle on, on what's being divested to civilian law enforcement agencies out throughout the country, uh, we need to narrow the type of equipment that's available for transfer. Uh, we need local lawmaking body approval in advance of that local law enforcement agency receiving it. That way there's a, an accountability mechanism uh, in the local community. And then we have, at a minimum, we should ensure through some sort of memorandum of, of agreement uh, that there's, you know, minimum training that occurs. And if there's some sort of event where uh, the training isn't being met, there's an ability for that, for essentially for us to go in uh, as a military and withdraw that equipment that's been uh, distributed to them. Right now, there's none of that in place, and that's well within our ability to control. So uh, those are just some thoughts on uh, the, the legal underpinnings and the, the public perception that, that concerns me, Ron. Well, and, and, uh, that is a, that is a crucial element. I mean, one of the things about these conversations, uh, and I know even when you go out and talk to groups in the Eisenhower program, it's not as though we come up to, we can tie a neat bow on everything, but we do raise difficult questions for people to deal with. I mean, the idea, uh, when you talk about the militarization of police, right, that's, it's a very practical problem, right? If, if police are going out, uh, looking just like soldiers, people are going to simply think of them as soldiers. And that's not necessarily what we want, how we want the police to engage with the people in their local community. And the idea about what does it mean to have the equipment? What does it mean to have the training? Um, and how that can lead to a kind of authority slippage, right? So you can say like, well, you know, it's not the, it's only the police are responsible for this, but if the police have grenade launchers and bayonets and armored personnel carriers, then the police can inflict a degree of violence on the community that 
maybe more than we want the police to be able to inflict on the community? It's a it's a very complicated question. And I guess for both of you, um, we, we're just about out of time for today, but I want to thank you both for getting here to have us think about these very complex questions of how do we preserve domestic tranquility, right? How do we how do we guarantee the rights of our fellow citizens to live in peace <laughs> and the rights of our fellow citizens to be secure in their persons and in their lives? We're supposed to be in the business of protecting them, right? We're not supposed to be in the business of finding new ways to make people feel threatened but also how do we deal with threats? I uh, I thank both of you. I thank Chris Powers. I thank Nate Minot for coming here today to talk about your, your work. Uh, and I wish you both luck in the future in your, uh, both if you continue to research and talk about these kinds of issues, but also in your work for, um, for this country. And, uh, and good luck, by the way, because I know commencement is coming up here at the uh, War College. So uh, I'm assuming I'll see you at graduation. So thanks a lot, guys, for being on A Better Peace. Thanks, Ron. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Ron. I appreciate it. And thanks all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all the programs. Send us uh, suggestions for future programs. We're always interested in hearing from you. Uh, please take a moment to uh, subscribe to A Better Peace on your pod catcher of choice in order to uh, expand d- domestic tranquility to yourselves and your posterity. Um, and after you have... Uh, subscribe to Better Peace. Please take a moment and rate and review this podcast because that's how more people can find out about us. We're always interested in growing the community for conversations like this one. And even if this conversation is at an end, we look forward to welcoming you in the future. So until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Granary. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.